So thank you ever so much for inviting me, Sana and Henrik and Emily. It's uh, it's a real privilege to be here. Of course, when when Sana told me about this um, this event, I got quite excited. But she didn't tell me that it's about is a music academy. I was thinking, am I going to sing for my lunch? I'm not a musician. I mean, I play the flute, but very badly, and I don't consider myself a, a musician. Um, however, I thought that it could be quite interesting to um, to do something. With you, I mean, unfortunately, I have to be quite static because of the because I don't have a clicker and all that. Um, do something with you that that try tries to trace a little bit these um, um, the the different kinds of research, the academic and the artistic research. And of course, the question often is whether by um, doing academic research we do kind of a much more much more serious research, whereas by doing an artistic research we kind of we somehow we we trace a little bit of a superficial uh, kind of uh, I don't know like a, a little lead in in the ideas, but we don't care so much about ideas. I mean, somebody said that artistic research essentially is a bit like really academic research light and without footnotes. Um, and in a way, it's a bit like that. But what I would like to do is is just just go through a very few steps, um, and I would like to do this with you. Um, I would like you to be thinking of your own research, whether it's artistic, academic, or both, or a mixture of either, um, and, and further other things. So I suppose music research can, can fall into either category, and, and presumably researching for a composition is probably more artistic research, but researching in terms of the history of the the stuff that you 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 know you're you're working on is more um, academic research. So I think at the same time, what I'm trying to do is ostensibly anyway, I'm trying to um, set up a um, something's happening with my voice very strange. Can you hear it? Or is, okay, Good, it's fine. <laughs> but um, um, I just wanted to think of it a little bit as a um, ostensibly as a as an antithesis, so artistic and academic research. I want us to think a bit of the differences uh, between these two things. And I want us to link them. Um, yeah, I want us to link them with something that usually doesn't, doesn't serve. There's a, there's a connection between the inside and the outside, always. There's a moment where you take in something that is out, and then you expel it, and it becomes out again. But quite often we realize that there isn't much of the outside. Everything is inside, everything is like, is held in. Um, what I would like us to do is, first of all, this rather strange thing. I wonder whether you could all just come here um, and take a piece of paper. I can be giving them to you, or I can just pass them out. I think we're enough for all of them. And then if you could just tear it uh, in, in half. Yeah, just go on. Thanks. Pleasure. It's quite satisfying, isn't it? You can pull it. Just pull it. So just tear it in half. Doesn't have to be very neat half. It could be whatever whatever half comes out. If you want. So this is plenty, so you can just play with them. Um, so these are two, if you don't mind sharing. So just tear it in half. And I would like you to take one half and fold it, or leave it as it is, or whatever you want to do with it, and make it, everyone has one? Amazing. And make it what you understand of academic research. 
and the other half would be what you understand as artistic research. And I would like to create a, two piles. One would be here, academic research. One would be here, artistic research. So you can't hmm? If you can't, no, no, not, not if you can do. It's sort of a imagining. Okay, so imagine that your research is a fold, it is a piece of paper, and it takes form. So when you're doing academic research, you might be organized. You might be thinking about going deep into the bibliography. You might think about sort of flattened research across the level. If you're doing artistic research, you might be thinking of different folds and different waves. You might be thinking of slightly, uh, I don't know, perhaps a different way of sort of thinking about the flatness, perhaps going a bit deeper but in a different way. So just think about what it is, what kind of shape. Think of origami, think of manifolds, think of Japan, I don't know. Think of, think of stuff that could work for you as a symbol and just pile them up. So here is academic research and, and here is artistic research. So each one of you will have to do one academic and one artistic. It's really quite important also, I think, how you, how you tear it. Some of you tore it in a really neat way, already presaging a very academic understanding of it, perhaps a very kind of a orderly and, and sort of almost by the rule or ruler. This is academic and this is artistic. So this is academic, and that's artistic. Do they fly? <laughs> academic, artistic. I think we should all be proud of, uh, of our sculptures. <laughs> Academic, artistic. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Academic over there, artistic here. Thank you. Now I would like you to do something, um, something else. You probably all have a bunch of keys with you, presumably, keys. So I wonder whether you could just fish them out from wherever you have them. Um, and I would like you to hold them during this performance talk. And what I would like you to do is actually um, jiggle them whenever I say something you agree with and whenever I say something you disagree with. So you jiggle the... May I hear a jiggle? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like you to jiggle when you agree with something and also when you disagree with something. So the question is, is it going to be the same sound? Yeah. So let's see. Let's start with a little bit of a, a binary. Censoring. Um, it has to do with the empiricism. It has to do with um, the standing somewhere on a tall white cliff and looking over the continent. It has to do with the idea that I can only trust what I see, what I hear, 
very little about what I can actually smell or touch, God forbid, we're English. Empiricism is all about this relying on the senses, yet censoring the senses, and censor with a W, with a C. Um, censoring the senses in the sense that we only rely on what we see and we hear, and we want to understand as something that is absolutely tangible, but without touching. Um, but at the same time, we delegate, we demote the senses from the first, um, from the first position. It's not about actually what we perceive. It's not about senses. It's about a rationality that has been built on this idea of just looking up to here. I mean, maybe one would say it's a Brexit mentality. I'm sorry about the, the, the really cheap, cheap joke. Um, censoring as a, as a characteristic of, of academic research um, relies very much on text. So academic research traditionally is very much about text. Thank you. Um, academic research is very much about um, somehow placing a beginning and an end and working your way through this, knowing pretty much where you're going to end up. Thank you. You jiggle when you agree with what I say. You jiggle when you disagree with what I say. Not everything. Agree or disagree. So, let me observe, let us think, let us take distance. Because, of course, if you take distance, you see things differently, right? You see things better, you see things clearer. I'm taking distance from you in order to see you better. And the distance can be all sorts of things. But I'm, I'm using my senses, but at the same time I'm pushing my senses away because what's coming up is really this. Academic research is all about language. And, of course, language isn't about the body. When we write, of course we use the body. But it's not about the body. It's about rationality. There's uh, zillions of theories that actually um, have argued how artistic research and academic research, or in, indeed writing specifically, is entirely different to it. Um, Clive Cazor has uh, dedicated a whole book, pretty much, well, his whole career, on the, on the differences between writing uh, and academic research. And on the other hand, we have sensing. But again, the sensing of artistic research sometimes is described as a flash. Sometimes it's described as I move around and I just see something, it jumps on me, and, and my senses are being it's sort of stimulated in a way that I, I can't help it. Or sometimes it's just a little thing here and there. Like I walk, I pick something up, and then I walk again, and I pick something else, and then I kind of, you know, make something that might or might not stand, and then. It's a bit better. And there's steps to all that, to the artistic research, but there's also a kind of a different understanding of where your body is. So you're, again, you're sensing, but not so much. It's not so much, again, about the senses. It's about slightly different things. It's about an encounter. And Deleuze gets ready to talk about the encounter as two bodies, two more bodies, um, come into an encounter with each other, and then one of them comes out stronger, or both of them come out stronger or weaker from this encounter. An encounter is a moment of change. An encounter is a moment of, um, of maybe even, it's not about consciousness, but it's about the body becoming stronger or weaker after encounter. Imagine that you encounter a lorry driving down the road at uh, high speed you're not going to come out much stronger out of that, are you? Not even the lorry will come out much stronger. But then, imagine you meet somebody you like, and they're telling you beautiful things about you, your research, your future, whatever, 
Hey, come on, Strong. So pre-sensing is something uh, that Patricia Townsend in her work on creative minds is uh, create states, states of mind. Uh, is trying to articulate as a thing that is there but without being there. This seems to be, at least in theory, the kind of the crux of artistic research. We don't know, but we kind of know. We have no full idea of what we want to do, but we kind of know. I hear no jiggling. I feel lonely here. <laughs> then show us. So encountering isn't, isn't the distance. I'm not going to go behind here. If I go behind here, I'm, I'm going to miss out on the opportunity of actual encounter. What I do is I expose myself and I immerse myself into something. I immerse myself into, into a connection, perhaps. Uh, I immerse myself into sensorial stimuli that might lead me in a certain way. But again, I'm not sure that it's going to lead me somewhere. I allow also my body to move in a particular way. Artistic research is all about the body. Um, <laughs> it's all about making. It's all about using your hands. I mean, of course, the mind is there, but perhaps less so. There's something about the use. So what is it that we use? Do we use our bodies and minds in order to produce artistic research? When you do your artistic research, do you actually engage all these things? Do you look into the specific text that you're trying to get inspiration from and you use it in a certain way? Maybe, maybe if we go by the, the idea of the encounter, we might use uh, psychoanalyst Christopher Bowler's uh, work on objects, where he says that actually we don't just use objects, but objects use us. And that is a proper encounter. That is when the object, and the object can be a, an immaterial thing as well, right? So the object is using us, is grabbing us, is m forming us, it makes us. So, I think my favorite kind of people are the people who have a thesis but have no direction, have no way of, of reaching it. <laughs> it's, cut, it's a wonderful thing, especially uh, I think my favorite PhD students um, are the ones who <laughs> sensed it, but they, ah, they just don't know how to get there. Or they do, and they, they go th this way, and then they come that way, and then somehow, you know, they... they <coughs> My favorite kind of people are the people who have a direction, but without a thesis. They know where they're going, but they don't know where they're going, and because they don't know where they're going, but they kind of know where they're going. So they kind of do a bit of a rhizomatic thing, and they kind of walk around a little bit like this. But they, I mean, what, um, yeah, you, they might end up here, but somehow the direction is everything that condenses it. My PhD students who have a direction without a thesis are the ones who really get me because they kind of they play with the various things. They kind of arrive somewhere, but not quite, and then they withdraw. They're fully immersed, but at the same time, they're fully withdrawn. Let's talk about things. So matter is everywhere. And everywhere doesn't describe where matter is, because matter isn't everywhere at the same time. We have to understand matter as both material and immaterial. We have to understand matter as something that constructs us, that cons we consist of matter, but at the same time, matter consists of ourselves. Matter is a link, but as a link, it's not, it's not tangible. It cannot be heard. Whenever we, then, then it's gone. As soon as you try to, <laughs> but 
But there is a way. There might be a way. If you allow yourself, what? Not binary, not becoming like that. But maybe, I don't know, maybe. So there's, a, there's an understanding of matter as a fold, as a, as a simultaneous immersion and encounter, as well as withdrawal, a distance. This is the definition of life. We are, at the same time, constantly and simultaneously connected. We are all, at the same time, constantly and simultaneously withdrawn. We have no, no access to matter. We have no access to self. But luckily, we have a new, lovely concept. So, question of materiality. I would like to, to, to define it, to imagine it precisely as this, as the fold between the immersion and the withdrawal. It's here and it's not here. Materiality is readily available for us. We do it all the time. It allows matter to withdraw quite regally, but also to shine through in the way that we need it. It allows a glimpse of death, but also immortality. Yeah, he starts, he knows exactly. I'm going. This is it. In order to write a PhD proposal, you must know exactly what you're going to write. In order to begin your career, you must already imagine the end of your career. Perfect bibliography. The Ecstasy of Santa Teresa the moment where the flow becomes coagulated, the moment where the flow folds, the moment where the flow is allowed to flow. Uh, um, I think it's end of 2014, um, my monograph on spatial justice, lawscape, what is it? Can't remember the title. Body, lawscape, atmosphere um, is being launched. Um, I'm already thinking that, um, I'm already thinking that I never managed to do academia very well. And I'm always doing academia in a kind of a non-traditional academic way. So. Um, it's fine, it's fine. I'm perfectly uh, treated where I am. I'm perfectly encouraged to do all the things I do. We are the only law school in the country that has a final year degree show where all our students submit an artifact um, which relates to themselves, the law, and their expectations of the course. But a book launch of that sort, you know, with rather prestigious rapidage and all the stuff. Um, so it lasted for about, I think, 15 minutes. There were some traditional speeches, and there were some huge ruptures of somebody from the audience, a couple of people in the audience, some readings, um, some musicians, um, choreographer, a couple of dancers, you know, the usual academic book launch and lots of lovely students. Oh. Yes, I see different things on my screen. It's not so much the audio, it's the end of show. Oh. Yep. It was supposed to be smooth. <laughs> Margaret is moving. It is a cabbage. The thing about the cabbage is breathing. 
Our desire consists in moving, being moved endlessly. Endlessly being moved. This continuous folding creates a new space, entirely baroque, yet still excessive, even for baroque aesthetic. The space of an absolute imminence of the manifold. This is the no-scape where bodies cannot be indifferentiated from space. Thank you.